friends talk about you behind your back. In fact, your bad breath is making you unpopular. How did that make you feel? Where does shame settle in your body? Perhaps your shoulders began to sag. Maybe your head began to hang, muscles weak as if the air itself is too heavy and it's all your fault. Or maybe you heard the title of this talk and you're thinking, she can't pull a fast one on me. Shame has the ability to paralyze the body and impairs our capacity to think and act clearly. It can feel like a fog or veil has settled over everything, making it difficult to function. When this happens, it's normal to revert to a sunken body posture, a physical expression of wanting to disappear as feelings of isolation and powerlessness take over. It's a feeling many of us probably experience when facing a common fear. Public speaking. <laughs> if we traded places right now, your muscles might start to feel like rubber. There's a reason I opted for the flats today instead of the heels. Many advertisers are aware of this phenomenon, and some are not afraid to use it to their advantage. A popular mouthwash brand, one that you probably have sitting on your bathroom counter at home, ran a wildly successful marketing campaign that resurrected an old Latin word for bad breath in order to invent a new disease, then turn around and sell you the cure. This is what marketers refer to as the halitosis effect. Before this campaign, society didn't consider bad breath to be an embarrassment, much less a disease. Today, however, a quick internet search of the term halitosis is likely to result in a list of symptoms, treatments, and preventative measures. You know what they say, four to five doctors recommend daily shame as a part of your morning routine. This campaign exploited the fears of the consumers, societal rejection using these shame-inducing accusations. Your friends talk about you behind your back. Your bad breath is making you unpopular. And even, no one wants to marry a pretty girl with halitosis. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with fear. If you've fallen prey to fear of shame-based marketing, you're not alone. I myself have 100% been guilty of adding yet another mascara tube to the makeup graveyard that completely covers my bathroom counter, vanity, and nightstand. But even before I had access to beauty products or the money to buy them, I already had access to the impacts of this type of messaging on my self-image. When I was a kid, probably around 12 years old, I discovered the scrub out tool in Photoshop. <laughs> this is a feature where you can completely get rid of anything that you don't want in your photo. And for me, that thing was my raccoon eyes. I thought I had found a life hack that nobody else knew about, and it was going to be a game changer. I spent hours in Photoshop scrubbing out my dark under eye circles from every family photo. This was back when we still sent out a Christmas letter, and you better believe I made sure every photo passed through me before it ever saw the light of day for our friends and family. A few short years later, I discovered a whole new frontier with social media. New connections, new ideas, new obsessions. The targeted ads were relentless. This weird hack will help you burn fat overnight. 13 of the best and worst celebrity beach bodies. The targeted workout you need to get rid of hip dips. So many new problem areas I had never known before. Muffin top. Bingo arms, thunder thighs. These messages flooded my feed and told me exactly what I needed to change if I expected others to look at me without disgust. According to research from Yanklovich Inc., the average person in North America sees roughly 4,000 to 10,000 ads per day. Many teen girls wake up in the morning to an alarm blaring from their phones. Before they brush their teeth, eat their first meal of the day, or even shower, their phone is in their hands, scrolling, scrolling, being influenced, inviting in a flood of stimulation and stressors into their brain space, moving at the speed of shame. While still in bed, they can instantly access TikTokers sharing their waist trainer results, a YouTuber describing what they eat in a day, or an Instagram influencer posting retouched beach pictures. 
And let's be honest, who here hasn't lost themselves down a Twitter rabbit hole at least once in their life? <laughs> to some, this may seem trivial. After all, we as adults understand that waist trainers may shift your internal organs, that eating less than 1,000 calories per day may be a symptom of an eating disorder, and that many images online are retouched, often beyond recognition. But to young, impressionable minds, these suggestions plant the seed of what they should be buying, using, wearing, or even who they should be, as opposed to what they might actually need. I thought as a kid that my scrubbed out under eyes were harmless and that it was undetectable. I just wanted to avoid being asked, are you sick? But the truth is that having a photo editing ritual made me for feel more insecure every time I looked in the mirror and I saw the unedited version of my own face. Fear is a powerful motivator. That's why we're bombarded with fear-based marketing. Rather than selling you the product's pleasure, some brands sell you the fear of missing out. Anyone ever heard of FOMO? Last week, I was trying to buy tickets for Dear Evan Hansen, and I was a bit on the fence about which ones I wanted to buy. I can be a bit indecisive at times, and this was not at all helped by the timer in the corner that was ticking down, letting me know I had exactly 15 minutes to check out or they were going to give away my tickets to someone else. Time pressure has the ability to completely change our decision-making process and affect our judgment, causing us to make risky choices. The little voice in our head shouts, it's now or never. Fear-based marketing can be influential and persuasive. Numerous psychological studies have demonstrated that people are more inspired and more driven by the fear of losing something than they are by the hope of gaining something. This principle is known as loss aversion. People want to avoid experiences that bring them any kind of pain, whether that be physical, mental, emotional, or even social. In fact, social pain such as rejection can cause responses in the brain similar to physical pain. Rejection literally hurts. Fear-driven headlines are often used on YouTube in the form of clickbait. Titles like 13 Reasons Why Your Boss Hates You Promise a Quick Fix. During the COVID-19 pandemic, information regarding food, face mask, and toilet paper shortages led to a drastic increase in demand. This demonstrates how fear motivates our buying decisions. It certainly impacted mine. I know I personally still have toilet paper in my garage that is industrial size, despite not having a dispenser capable of holding a wheel of toilet paper. <laughs> If only everything in life was as reliable as fear. Fear-based marketing can be controversial, but for many folks it comes down to one single question. Does it work? The answer is yes, fear-based marketing works at creating negative emotions. Does it work at getting us to click add to cart? There the waters start to get a bit more murky. Let me ask you something. When you walk into a convenience store, what do you see? Signs saying smoking causes fatal lung cancer. What do people still do? Smoke. It appears that overuse of fear in marketing can result in feelings ranging from passive helplessness to outraged backlash, neither of which gets more focus put on the message's call to action. And yet, another example had the opposite impact. A Vietnamese ad campaign saved countless lives by depicting the gruesome results of riding a motorcycle without a helmet. This fear-based campaign was truly effective. There is nuance to the ethical consideration here. We have to ask ourselves, is there a legitimate cause for fear, or are we simply being manipulated? Speaking of manipulation, shame-based marketing encourages consumers to feel self-conscious about the ways that others perceive us. This type of advertising first creates shame, then sells a solution. Shame marketing taps into distress over perceived failures, stirs up, and even creates insecurities. Businessman Jonah Sachs calls this inadequacy marketing. For example, a beer commercial in which the bartender tells a man, when you start caring about how your beer tastes, put down your purse and I'll get you a real beer, followed by a voiceover command to man up implying to men everywhere that if they don't drink that specific brand of beer, they are not real men. A gym ad with a picture of a barrel and the words, this is no shape for a woman. 
A PSA using black and white photos of real kids and a bright red slogan. Warning, fat prevention begins in the buffet line. Shame, it's what's for dinner. Studies indicate that the brains of our youth are vulnerable, dynamic, and highly responsive to feedback. Children yearn to fit in with their peers, to belong. These advertisements send the message that who you are is wrong and bad and must be corrected in order for you to be accepted. The narrative is, how horrible would it be to be Madison or Sarah or Aiden or even yourself? These tactics are condescending, othering, and a desperate play of superiority at the expense of others. There is one factor that makes shame-based marketing much more dangerous than any other type. Shame never has to be put to the test. You see, fear-based marketing works when the threat of harm seems real. Shame, on the other hand, has little to prove. A mere suggestion is enough to make your stomach twinge with anxiety, similar to that feeling in the pit of your stomach following a breakup. Shame can rely on the implication that your wife would never say this to you directly, but she'd be more than happy to gossip about it behind your back. The advertisement that you see saying the words, muffin tops are only good in a bakery, will never have to prove its implied message that fat bodies are unlovable. They just have to make you feel unlovable. But this goes beyond mere discomfort. As Brene Brown once said, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. Studies indicate that those who battle alcoholism are more likely to relapse if they feel ashamed. This applies to other problematic behaviors as well. Those who live with shame are more likely to resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms because they feel that they are worthless. Shame locks us into our harmful patterns by telling us that healing is not possible. Because of this, marketing that shames the consumer is unlikely to result in truly changed behavior. Now, you may be asking yourself, that's all well and good, but why would a company whose goal is to make money care about the fallout of shame-based marketing? Isn't it all about the bottom line? But the truth is there is so much more to selling than just increased revenue. There's also brand reputation, emotive association, customer referrals, and buyer trust. Consumers of today are unique. The digital age is changing the way that we research and select products. Picture the last shopping trip you made. Chances are you probably saw some of your fellow shoppers on their phones. Maybe they were tweeting or wishing their mom a happy birthday, but some were likely looking up product reviews and competitor pricing. It is no longer enough to simply say, our product is the best. You have to back it up. Studies indicate that before making an in-store purchase, over 80% of smartphone users will conduct internet research on their devices. Recent shifts in marketing have demonstrated that managing a successful business is no longer about making a sale at any cost. It's about customer experience. Many brands make promises that go beyond product functionality and instead reflect a facet of their target audience's identities. A great example of this is the Dove Real Beauty campaign. They have effectively moved beyond just a method of cleansing your body and instead remind us all that all bodies are worthy. As Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Studies indicate that empowering marketing tactics equip consumers with the options, tools, and resources they need to make a more informed decision, resulting in more loyal customers who come back to purchase again and again. Empowering marketing helps customers feel satisfied with the brand experience, motivated to interact positively with the company, and excited to become brand evangelists. Shame marketing paints the consumer as the villain in their own stories. We are the ones messing things up, dropping the ball, and embarrassing ourselves. Empowering marketing, on the other hand, paints us as the hero in our own stories, with the power to enact change on our own, with the product or service coming alongside us to help. Parents, it's important to note who is most affected by this type of marketing and who is most vulnerable. Teens. But you have an opportunity here. Open up conversations with your kids. The next time you see a fear-based slogan, don't be afraid to share how it makes you feel. 
The next time you hear a shame-based marketing campaign, don't be afraid to say, ugh, that made me feel a little yucky. And be prepared to answer why if your kid asks you, really, what's that about? When you purchase based on positively marketed products, share that as well. You know the impact of fear and shame-based marketing. Now you have the power to move forward consuming with intention. Your voice matters. You have the power to vote with your dollar. And if you're not sure if that's really true, consider the recent case of a very famous lingerie company who abandoned a long-standing practice of relying on unrealistic beauty standards and who now showcases real-life female role models. Why? Pressure from the public. I guess the secret's out. Your voice really does matter. And if you're somebody who has internalized the message that you are not enough, know this. You are not alone. And it is never too late to push back and say, no, I refuse to believe that. The version of me who struggled so much with her dark under eye circles never knew the freedom that comes from embracing herself, imperfections and all. And it wasn't until I gave myself permission to start taking up space unapologetically that I started to understand that those flaws don't define me. That little girl who edited every single family photo would never have guessed that today I would be signed as a model. Let me ask you two questions. Who was the first person who told you you are not enough? And second, what if they were wrong? <laughs>